morning to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And I'm going to also read a couple of verses in uh, Genesis 2 and also in Genesis 3. All right. Genesis chapter 1. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. You can follow along on the screen if you're here. And uh, we want to honor God's Word. If you're able to stand by doing so, I want to read these passages of Scripture. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. It says this, Then God saw everything that He made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, it says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Genesis chapter 3. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. For God knows in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded that you not, should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his feet, his heel. So the woman said, I will, great, I will greatly, to the woman, he said, I will, will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it. All the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Then therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turns every way to guard the way of the tree of life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a good God. And Lord, even in the midst of our sin, You care. Even in the midst of the consequences of sin, You care. And Lord, You came. And Lord, because You came, we have hope. So Lord, today we ask You to open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, open our hearts to understand, 
And we will give you thanks and praise now and forever in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The title of the message today is Pain in Paradise. Pain in Paradise. You know, you think of paradise, and of course, we see it here clearly demonstrated in the Garden of Eden. What would it have been like to live in the Garden of Eden? I mean, a wonderful place, a perfect place. Everything God created was good. It was very good. And yet, right there in paradise, there was pain. It doesn't matter where you live in our world today. It may be here in Texas. This is a Texas paradise, East Texas. Or you might live in the Caribbean, or you might live in Mexico. There's some beautiful places in Mexico. There's beautiful places all around our world that they call paradise, but there, no matter where you go, there's going to be pain. There is pain in paradise. Now, why is there pain in our world? Maybe you're experiencing pain. It may be physical pain, and I tell you, that's a, that's a difficult one to deal with. But then there's others who may be feeling fine physically, but they're in emotional pain. Maybe with a divorce, maybe a marriage situation, things going on with their children. Maybe because of drugs or alcohol or Maybe the loss of a job, economic pain. You, maybe you're going through stress at work. All kinds of things that pull us down. And you don't have to be old to experience that. You can be a teenager and experience pain. Because today's world that we live in, there's all kinds of problems, all kinds of disappointments, all kinds of disillusionment that cause people to experience pain all across the board. So the question is, where did pain begin? Why didn't God create a perfect world? Well, He did. He did. He created a perfect world. Have you thought about that? I know a lot of people are blaming God for all the evil and all the sickness and all the pain, all the stuff that's going on in our world. But God did not create the world that way. Amen? If you want to know where the pain all began, it began right there in the garden in a perfect place with people who decided not to be satisfied in paradise. Amen? I mean, He created this world free of pain. Today, we're dealing with pain. You see, what happened in the garden is a serpent entered in to that place. A serpent. We're going to talk a little bit more about the serpent in just a moment, but I want you to tell you, before there was a, a serpent, there was no sin. And before there was no sin, there was no pain. So it was the, through the serpent who deceived and brought forth sin to men and women who decided they were not going to believe God's Word, but they were going to believe a lie. So many people today are dealing with consequences, not because of God. They're dealing with consequences because they're living by a lie. There are people today who are living with deceptions about their identity. There are people today that are living with lies about what's right and what's wrong. What's good and what's evil. It's all distorted and as a result, it doesn't matter. You know that you choose to do wrong or right. You can choose. You have a free will. God gave you that free will. It is your gift. God gave it to you. And with that free will, you can choose to love God or you can choose not to love God. In fact, there is no such thing as love without a free will. If someone holds a gun up to your head and says, you either tell me you love me or I'm going to kill you, and you say, all right, man, I love you. And then the guy puts down his gun, oh, man, hugs you and says, I'm so glad you love me. You go, this guy's crazy. I mean, I said I love you at the point of a gun. You see, we... We have a free will to choose to love God. By a free will, we can love God or we can choose not to love God. We can choose to obey God or not obey God. And you can live your life choosing what you want, and you're free to do that, but you're not free to choose the consequences of your sin. You're free to do anything you want. And you can do it till your heart is content or condemned. But you cannot choose the consequences that come with that. Because there are consequences with disobedience. And there's blessings with obedience. Amen? Well, pain came 
because the serpent came, deceived Adam and Eve, and they believed the lie, and sinned against God, and pain came into the human race. Why is pain continuing? Well, because Adam and Eve, when they sinned, God says, you will surely die. He brought, they brought a curse upon the human race. They brought a curse not only on the human race, but all creation right now is groaning under the weight of sin. Romans chapter 8 tells us that. All creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And I'm not talking about a doctrine. I'm talking about when Jesus Christ comes back and delivers this world from its curse. That's why it's still going on. Not only that, but we are still suffering in this world because of the sinful choices of others that are not our own. Did you know that if someone chooses to rob a store and someone that robs a store kills somebody, there are consequences that come upon not only the person who robbed the store, but the people who are affected by their sin. People say, well, why did God allow that to happen? Because God gave us a free will. And God gave men a free will. And God is going to straighten it all out one day, but in the meantime, He has made a way for salvation. Have you accepted that way of salvation? I want to tell you that way of salvation we're going to talk about is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone and what He did on the cross for you and me. We also have pain because of our own sin. Now sin, you think, well, I'm not a bad person. Look, we're all sinners, and the Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I thank God that by faith I have the righteousness of God I walk in that today but by nature our fallen nature is we are sinners and we sin we we don't do what's right and we do what's wrong we sin by commission meaning we we disobey and we sin by omission meaning we don't do what we're supposed to do and so we sin and sin brings consequences it brings consequences in marriage it brings consequences with children it brings consequences at your job it brings consequences with your finances sin bears consequences and our world is full of pain because of the effects of sin the consequences of our disobedience and yes life is not fair we understand that life is not fair but God is good God is good all the time and even in our pain, God is good. Even in our failures, God is good. Well, what about this serpent? Let me just give you a little idea that he is, the, he is the enemy of your soul. He is the enemy of God. He is the enemy of God's people. Before the fall, this serpent was called Lucifer, which means morning star. He was a, an anointed cherub. Who covered? He was important in the work of God until the day that iniquity was found in his heart. What was that iniquity? That iniquity was when pride entered in. He began to not be satisfied with what he was. He wanted to be more than what he was. You know, there's that thing that the devil tricked Adam and Eve and said, you eat of this and you'll be like God. That's the same thing that, that the serpent wanted to be, was to be like God. Isaiah chapter 14, I will exalt my throne into the heavens. I will be like the Most High God. You see, people today, pride is the same thing the devil works on us. Pride. Pride. Most people are going to go to hell because of a five-letter word, P-R-I-D-E, pride. And pride is the one thing that keeps people from getting saved. Because, see, pride means I have to humble myself and admit I'm a sinner. And then I can't blame God, and I can't blame you, and I can't blame anybody else. I, I can't even blame Adam and Eve. I've sinned. I've done my own damage. See, Adam and Eve sin, but we just keep it going. And so we're all to blame in this. And we all are experiencing the pain and the consequences that come with that pain in life. Well, after the fall, he is called Satan, which means adversary. He is called the devil, which means slanderer. He is called the, uh, the tempter. When he came to Jesus in the wilderness. He is called the accuser of the, brev the brethren. He is called the ruler of this world. He is called the God of this age. He is called the prince of the power of the air. He is the great dragon of the book of Revelation. Who makes war against God in heaven. And makes war against God's saints here on the earth. And the Bible says that he deceives the whole world. What is his main weapon that he uses? It's deception. It's deception. I want to tell you what, deception is a tricky thing because nobody thinks they're deceived. 
Nobody would say they would be deceived, but that's the very power of deception because deceived people don't know they're deceived, right? Or else they wouldn't be deceived. But people who, think, who are truly deceived think they're on the right track. Now how in the world are we going to know whether we're deceived or not deceived? We're going to have to go by a higher standard than our own opinion or the opinions of others, the assessment of others. We're going to have to go by the standard of truth, which is none other than the Word of God right here. Amen? I mean, we're going to have to get in this book and it's going to be a mirror that you're going to look in and you know when you look at a mirror in the morning that you don't really like what you see. But you better get real with what's in the mirror because you may say, well, that's a lying mirror. I don't believe that. I believe I'm... I'm wonderful and I look wonderful and when you go out, people are going to be looking at you and it ain't because you're so looking good. Amen. They're going to say, man, you missed the mirror today. And you can tell a lot of Christians today, they've been missing their mirror for a long time. Amen. They hadn't been getting in the Word and looking in there and just saying, God, show me what I need to change about myself. And God, I may not like it, but I need it. God, I may not want to hear it, but I need to hear it. God, I may not want to change, but I need to change. Because there are consequences to sin whether I like it or not. And I can choose to disobey God, but the consequences are going to come anyway. So we need to get real with the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Well, not only was there pain in paradise, but there's a promise in paradise. There's a promise in paradise. God gave a promise in the pain of paradise. And right now I want you to know no matter what you're going through today, there is a promise in paradise for you. That promise came right there in the Garden of Eden before Adam and Eve were ever taken out of the garden. God gave a promise. And that promise is found there in the 15th verse of Genesis chapter 3. And I will put enmity, he's talking to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You see, God promised that there would be a seed that would come. This was a promised seed. This was one that was going to come and be the Savior of the world that was going to defeat the serpent and save mankind. Hallelujah. I thank God for the promise in paradise. Amen? There is a promise in paradise. Jesus came as the seed of a woman. He was born of, of the Virgin Mary, not of a human man, but He was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He was the seed of the woman, not the seed of the man. Amen? And so... He broke the power right there of the curse that came down through Adam. He was born the seed of the woman by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is a seed that the serpent crushed his heel on the cross. You see, Satan thought he won. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that the devil, actually the principalities and powers, they actually thought they won when they crucified Jesus. Like they had actually done what could not be done. They had killed the Savior. The seed that was going to come and crush His head. Well, guess what? He showed up and we got Him. We got Him. And the devil was waiting for Him all through the centuries. When is that seed going to show up? When is that seed going to come? The one He said is going to crush my head. We did it. We got Him. Now, we won. Right? Until the three days later, right? When the Son of Man came out of that grave, glorified, he was the stone rolled away, the grave could not hold him, amen. He came out victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And at that point, all of hell went into crisis mode. All of the demons of hell went into panic mode. Everyone knew this has been turned tables on them. And in their wisdom, they now have been shown to be very, very foolish. Amen. Jesus Christ crush the serpent's head. You can step on a serpent's tail and that snake still bites you. But when you step on the head and crush it, you've done the damage where it needs to be done. Amen. Jesus went right to the head. He defeated Satan in his own ball game. In all of his deception, all the lies, all the hate, all the bitterness of mankind thrown against the Son of Man at the crucifixion, Jesus Christ said from the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Could you do that from the cross in front of the people that are crucifying you, spitting on you, cursing you, and everything you've done is good and now they hate you for it? I tell you, Jesus conquered hate. Jesus conquered sin. Right there, He took it all. Your sin, my sin, all of our sin. He took it to the cross. It was nailed to the cross, Colossians chapter 2 says. And now He's triumphing over the demons of hell and over Satan himself triumphing every time a person gets saved the devil he is so so upset 
It's another reminder of what Jesus did on the cross. Well, God sent that seed to deliver us. Listen to what John 3, 14 through 18 says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, stop right here, remember the story, the people complained against Moses and against the Lord, and the Lord sent serpents among them. And you know serpents, poisonous serpents, when they bite you, you're going to die, okay? In that place especially. And so here they were being bitten by these serpents and they began to realize that consequences were happening, the pain of those consequences, people were beginning to die and they cried out to Moses, we have sinned. And Moses sought the Lord and the Lord says, you get a, a bronze serpent, make a bronze serpent, put it on a pole and raise it up high where everybody can see it and tell the people if they will look upon that bronze serpent, they will live and not die. Now what kind of salvation is that? I mean, there's no you know, uh, cure in terms of some inoculation. Just simply faith in what he said. You could look up there and say, ah, that's just an old bronze serpent. That can't do anything for me. All it required was faith. To look and believe. Look and believe. Look and believe. Look and believe. Have you looked upon the cross today? Have you looked upon the Savior and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because He has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I want you to know when Jesus hung on that cross, He was hanging up there like that serpent. He was becoming what we were. We were poisoned by sin. The poison of sin running through our veins. We were like the people in the wilderness. The, the, the serpent had deceived us, struck us with deception. And the poison of sin is slowly killing us until... Finally, we die and go to hell. God sent a Savior. God sent a Savior who hung on that cross. He became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For God made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. You see today, there's a great substitution that took place. Jesus hung on your cross so that you could experience eternity with Him. You see, He is the one who loves you. Who else would do that for you? Most people would die for a king, but who would, what king would ever die for His servants? That's the kind of love our king has. Amen? Well, I want to tell you today, whatever you're trusting in to get you to heaven, I want to tell you, your church can't get you to heaven. As wonderful a church as I believe we have right here, Grace Fellowship will not get you to heaven. Amen? We can help point you the way. And point you to the one that's hanging on that tree. They hung on that tree for you. Good works can't save you. It doesn't matter how many good works you give, uh, do. And it doesn't matter how much money you give. Good works won't get you there. Religion can't save you. Denominations can't save you. Theology can't save you. You can know all about the book. You can quote the whole thing and still go straight to hell. You see, spirituality can't save you. A lot of people today say, well, I'm just a spiritual person. I'm not a really... Re I'm not really uh, you know, any certain thing, I'm just a spiritual person. Spirituality is sending so many people right to hell because it's so deceiving to think that somehow you're able to discern what's true and false within yourself. Amen? Good intentions can't save you. The church can't save you. Your mom and daddy can't save you. They may pray for you every day, but they can't save you. You may have grown up in a Christian home, but growing up in a Christian home doesn't save you. You see, your Christian friends can't save you. Mary and the saints can't save you either. The angels of heaven can't save you. There's only one person, friends, that can save you. And that is the seed, the Son of God, the Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. All you have to do is lift up your eyes and look upon Him that you might be saved. Isaiah 45, 22. Here's a verse that Charles Spurgeon was saved when he heard this verse who came stumbling into an old primitive Methodist church. He was asking the question everywhere he went, how can I get my sins forgiven? 
How can I get my sins forgiven? And nobody could give him the answer. Church after church after church. But as a 15 year old boy. In a blizzard one winter in January. He stumbled into a primitive Methodist church. And he heard these words. Not from a pastor. But from an older elder man. Who stood up to fill the pulpit that day. And read these words. Isaiah 45, 22, Look to me and be saved. All you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. He said look. Look to Him. Look to Him. All you have to do is look. All you have to do is look and by faith believe. What can a man hanging on a cross do for you? He came to save your soul. What can a man that came and died for you do? He can save your soul. He can deliver you from the power of the devil. And He can set you free from the power of sin. All you have to do is look upon Jesus and believe. And once you determine that you're going to look and believe, it doesn't matter how much poison of sin is in your veins, Jesus Christ will set you free. It doesn't matter how hard the devil has fought against you. Once you look and believe, there's no devil of hell and Satan himself can't stop you from being saved. Amen. Hallelujah. God kept His promise in the garden. The promise in paradise. God kept His promise. And a seed came. Jesus Christ. And He put His heel on the head of the devil. And just delivered Him. And hung on a cross to deliver you. Amen. To deliver you from His power. Well, Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. So the question is, are you ready? You're not ready if you haven't looked and believed. I hope today you will look and believe. And I want to pray for those who today would say, you know, I, if I were to die right now, I don't know that I would go to heaven. I mean, I go to church. I may, I may do some good things. I think I'm a good person. But as I said, good works won't get you there. Being a good person won't get you there. The only thing that's going to save you is to look and believe. Look and believe. Look and believe. If you've never done that, I want to remind you of Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if you will confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If that's you today and you know God's dealing with your heart, doesn't matter whether you're 88 or 8 or 2, whatever you are. If God's dealing with you today, I want us to pray this prayer. And let's all pray it out loud. Especially those who know you need to be saved today. Dear God, it's me a sinner in need of a Savior. And I believe that Jesus Christ came to this earth as the promised seed, the Messiah, the Son of God. And they lived a perfect life. And He died on a cross for me. For my sin. I believe He died that He rose again, He ascended to heaven, and He's coming back. I believe that Jesus Christ died for me. I believe that if I will look and believe, if I will trust, I will be saved. I will be delivered from the power of the devil and saved from the power of sin. I believe, Jesus. I believe that You are the Christ the Son of the living God, come into my life. Save my soul. Give me a brand new life. It belongs to You. I will follow You as my Lord, as my Savior from this day forward. Use my life to make a difference in the lives of others. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you prayed that prayer today, we're going to give you an opportunity to come and confess that right now. So, as we have an invitation, I will meet you right here at the front.